Greetings! In this video we're going to be talking about computer networks. This lesson is going to focus on a pretty broad level, but we're going to go into some depth. We're going to talk about the difference of clients and servers, talk about protocols, what they're used for, and why they're needed so that computers can communicate with each other. And then we're going to talk about terms like IP addresses and ports. And we'll go into more details and follow on videos, but we'll show you today what they're generally used for. And then we're going to talk about terms like circuit and packet switch networks. Our goal at the end of this lesson is to get you a better sense of how networks work, whether it's the internet or some other type of computer network. To get us started, I thought we'd go briefly over what a network is. If you just go straight to the dictionary, a network is just a group of interconnected things. But for computer scientists, we're primarily concerned with the interconnection of computer equipment for the purposes of sharing information. There are lots of computer networks out there. The most obvious ones are like uh, the internet, your phone, your telephone network. But there are also lots of other ones that are used uh, for special cases or in the military. So for example, a SCADA network is a network that is designed for industrial equipment. So the network that a power plant uses to coordinate reactors and that sort of thing. We'll go into more detail about those types of uh, networks because they're very special. IADs are networks that control air defense systems, so things like SAM sites. Tactical data links are networks that connect troops on the battlefield, so like soldiers communicating with uh, aircraft, communicating with ships, communicating with command, right? So just that's the network that we build out there on the battlefield. The LMR is a network for land radios, and the SATCOM is obviously just for uh, satellite communications. So it's easy to think of computer networks as just the internet. Uh, and I will admit that for a lot of this lecture we will focus on the internet, but it's important to remember that networks is a much broader term and it encompasses a lot, other, uh, lot more areas. So now let's go into some basic terminology. So I'm going to use the term host to refer to just a computer on the network, regardless of what it's doing. If it's connected, we're going to call it a host. So your PS4 and your Xbox are hosts, your, uh, your laptop and a server out there, those are all going to be considered hosts. A server is a special type of host. It's one that has content that other computers want. A client is a host that wants the content from the server. So the server is like the provider and the client is like the requester. All right. It's important to remember that client and server aren't static roles. Your computer acts like a client many times throughout the day, but there are times when it can be a server. Maybe it's hosting a file for another classmate or something like that. And then the term message I'm going to use to describe the actual data we want to share between the computers. So to visualize this, uh, a client would be just a typical desktop usually. A server is a special computer sitting out there. But again, these roles, you know, they may flip during the course of a day. It just matters who wants the information and who has it. And then they communicate with each other using messages. So this is basically networks at a very, very high level. So let's go into a little bit more detail and we're going to use an example of getting a, the homepage from Netflix.com. So your computer is out there, it communicates through the internet, it goes to the Netflix server and it gets the web page. So this is probably the simplest diagram I can draw for you and it's probably too simple because there's a lot going on behind the scenes. I'm going to focus today on protocols, IP addresses, ports, and how those messages traverse the internet. Because in each case there are special challenges that we're trying to overcome. So let's get started. The first challenge we have to figure out is how are these computers going to talk to each other? So obviously, if we don't coordinate in advance, it could be the case that the client sends a message to the server that the server just doesn't understand. It would be akin to if one was speaking English and one was speaking French. So the first thing we have to do is establish some sort of common language that allows clients and servers to talk to each other. That common language is what we refer to as a protocol. So a protocol basically defines the ways that clients and servers get to talk to each other. So they can specify how the client requests information, how the server is going to respond to that request, and basically that's it. The easiest way to think of protocols is think of all network communications as basically a giant instant messenger conversation. So here you have your client, you have your server, and the client is saying, give me your home page, and the server says, here you go. So in the protocol itself, the actual official protocol, it looks a little bit different. So this, for example, in the HTTP protocol, which is the protocol used to get web pages, this is how you request a, um, a, mess a web page from the server. It looks exactly like this. And then this is exactly what the server sends back, uh, down to the letter, of what that response would look like. 
So there's lots of different types of protocols. HTTP, as I already alluded to, that's the protocol that uh, your web browser uses to request web pages from a web server. SMTP is the protocol that we use to send emails to a, an email server. And then FTP is the protocol that we use to get files. The protocols aren't just um, you know, just out there willy-nilly. Uh, there's actually a group of people called the Internet Engineering Task Force. I kid you not, that's their name. And they actually define all these protocols. So if I was to click here, we could actually see what a protocol looks like. So this here is the very long specification for what the uh, HTTP protocol looks like. Uh, for example, if I want to get a web page, this tells me all the information I need to know uh, what that message would look like, how it would be formatted, and all that stuff. So there's lots of protocols, literally thousands, and it's important to remember that they're all made up. A bunch of people got together and said, this is how we're going to do it, and then they went back and they devised their computers to uh, make sure they follow that protocol. And it's only because of this that we can have any type of network communications. So now we have a common protocol. So let's assume that the client and the server know how to send messages to each other in a way that they can understand it. So now, how do we ensure that our message actually gets to the correct computer? So let's say I want to get this web page from Netflix.com, and there's all those computers out there, right, on the internet, literally billions, right? So how do I talk to that one? So the answer is that we need some sort of way to address a computer to assign it a unique identity that we can use to say I want to talk to this computer as opposed to this one and that's where IP addresses come in so an IP address basically represents your computer's unique location on the internet when you connect to a network you are basically given an IP address we'll talk more about that next lesson and your IP address can be either a public in that other computers on the internet can see this address or it's private only the computers inside your network can see it and again we'll talk more about that next lesson it's pretty easy to see your IP address all you have to do is uh, if you go and load up the command prompt on your computer and you type IP config and you press enter you will see all of the network adapters on your computer uh, I'm connected on a LAN connection with Ethernet, so this is my IP address right here. Uh, you can see it's unique, only my computer has it on this network, but there is something interesting about this address, and we'll talk more about it next lesson, that if you go home and you type the same command, you it is possible for your IP ad you to have the same IP address, and we'll talk more again about why that's allowed. All right. So when a computer sends a message, they basically have to generate something called a packet. So they take the message and then they add to it some information. They include the destination IP address. So this is where we want the uh, message to go to. And then the source address. This is the IP address of the computer that sent it. You can think of this like when we send uh, mail. Uh, the uh, destination address is basically where we want the mail to go to. And the source address, you can think of it as like our return address. Um, it's just basically all the information we need to get a message to the destination and then for the destination to know who sent it so that we can send back a response. So as that packet gets put on the network, um, we can basically look at that IP address and routers can forward it. And we'll talk more again about how that process actually works. So now we've kind of solved a couple of problems, right? We said that uh, every computer needs an IP address so that we can identify them. We said that they all have to have a protocol, some sort of common language so that they can talk to each other. And now we have these packets, right? And remember, the term packet is referring to the message itself plus all the information that it needs in order to get uh, the message safely to its destination. But now there's another hidden problem. So how do we make sure that the packet gets to the right application on the server? Servers are usually big and expensive and they're usually doing a lot of things. So for example, it's not uncommon to have a server ser uh, be a web server and then run another application that's handling email and then run another application that's doing file sharing. You know, a server could be doing literally hundreds of different things at a time, providing lots of content because again, they're big, expensive, fast computers. So we want to make sure that this message for a web page goes to the application running on the server that provides web pages and not to the email and file sharing applications. So there's not enough information in this packet to actually do that. So how do we do this? And the answer is that we have to have some more information that specifies what application this packet is intended for. And that brings us to our discussion on ports. A port 
is basically a logical location on your computer that's provided by the operating system where an application can listen for incoming network traffic. You can think of it a lot like the uh, P.O. boxes and the USAFA mailroom. Everybody has the same USAFA mailing address, right? So that's like your IP address. But the P.O. box is like your port. It's where you are listening or waiting to receive information that is just for you, right? So each application can listen on one or more ports. Two applications cannot listen on the same port. All right. And there are lots of published resources out there. Here's the link on Wikipedia if you want to see. But there are basically uh, giant tables out there where we say if, if you want to use HTTP and get websites, you have to use TCP port 80. That's the standard port that a server will be listening on for that data. If you want to uh, get files, the, the server will be listening on port 21 uh, for those requests. Uh, your computer has lots of ports, 2 to the 16th, which is 65,536 TCP and UDP ports. We'll talk about that in a second here. Um, basically, the ports that are under 1,024, those are the ones that we reserve for applications, for like the most common ones. And then the ports that are bigger are either temporary or for special applications um, out there. So like World of Warcraft, for example, just went and grabbed, you know, a, like port 54,000 or something like that because it's just a special case. All right. When you send a message now, not only do you have to include the IP address of the destination, now you have to put the port number that the uh, recipient's listening on for that information, and you also have to specify the port number on your computer where you are listening for the response. So again, think of this as like a P.O. box, and it's going to be okay. I talked a little bit before about TCP versus UDP. And without going into too much detail, what's important to remember is that when we send a message across a network, we, need, we have some options on how we want to send it. So TCP and UDP specify how those packets are sent. UDP uh, stands for User Datagram Protocol, but we tend to think of the U as being unreliable. Uh, UDP, when I send a message using the UDP protocol, all I'm really doing is in saying, I put it out there and I hope it gets there. So this would be akin to like, putting a stamp on a letter, putting it in the mailbox and saying, I hope it gets there. And if it doesn't get there, nothing I can do. All right. So the messages are going to be delivered to the application. Uh, you can't even guarantee the order they're going to get there. They may not even get there at all. All right. And they, this tends to be used for applications like streaming video or real time applications. It's where not getting or losing a packet along the way, it doesn't make a big deal. So if you're watching a, a Netflix stream, for example, and you uh, miss one of the frames of animation, there's no sense of re, you know, resending it because you're already past that point in the movie. So that's where we would use something like a UDP protocol. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. This is our more reliable one. So this is like if I go to the post office and I put a stamp on it and I tell the uh, post office tech that I want like uh, delivery confirmation, right? So this one, it makes sure that the messages are delivered in the correct order and it will send back a confirmation to the computer if that message actually gets there. And it will even notify the sender if the message doesn't get there so that the sender can resend it. So the important part here is with UDP, I don't know if the message will ever get there. With TCP, the protocol is designed to make sure that the message gets there exactly the way you intended it to. So this one's going to be used for things like web pages, files, stuff where you need to get all the pieces of it for it to make sense. So as you can see, this diagram keeps on getting filled up. Uh, we started off with our protocol, which defined our language. We added the IP address so that we knew where each computer was on the network. Right? And notice that each one has a unique IP. We, then we introduced the concept of ports. And we said each application is listening on one or more ports using either TCP or UDP ports. Uh, for information intended for it. And then you'll notice here that the client is also listening on a port for a response from the server. So now we finally have all the information we need to generate our packet that can get from the uh, source to the destination. So we, we have the actual message we want to send. We specify the IP address of the destination and the port that we want uh, the message to be directed towards. And then we also specify our own IP address and the port we're listening for that information. So we've talked about everything except the actual uh, transmission part. How does that message travel through the internet cloud? Um, there's basically two ways to do it, and they're both a form of what we call switching. So the first type of switching we're going to talk about is a circuit switched network. And with the circuit switched network, what we are doing is forming a dedicated channel for the duration of the communication. 
So here is a photograph of a telephone operator. In the old days, if you wanted to call someone, you told the operator who you wanted to talk to, and he or she literally took a cable and formed a wire connection between your phone and the phone you wanted to talk to. That's basically what circuit switching is. So we're establishing a dedicated channel from the source to the destination. All the messages travel along that path. So there are some benefits. Um, it's a constant physical path. Right? And the packets are going to be sent and received in order. And that's, that's great. Like just to, it's one less thing you have to worry about right? because they're all taking the same path. The downside is that no one else can use this circuit. So if someone else wants to communicate with this terminal, we have to wait for this communication to finish. And if any link in this chain is broken, there's no fallback. Right? It, the communication is just broken. It doesn't seem like a big deal if you're just talking you know, relatively short distance. But if you're communicating across the world, there's a good chance that a link could fail. An alternative way is using what we call packet switching. And with packet switching, what we're doing is we are uh, making packets travel using the best available path, where the best available path could change from moment to moment. So here is what it looks like. You have a source, and he takes uh, the message, and then it chops it up, and then it sends it along the network. So in this case, maybe the best path was to go here for packets one and two, but then this is getting congested, so now the best uh, path is for to go along this way for three and four. They both eventually get to their destination, but they're taking different routes, so you know they may arrive out of order. So the benefit here is that you know it's very redundant. You know, if this path fails, you know, there's always you can make use of another path. So there's it's lot it's a lot more fault tolerant. Um, it also allows us to share the line. So lots of people can use the same line at the same time and there's not really an issue. The downside is that, like I said, there's this. Uh, there's no guarantee that the packets are going to arrive, and then the packets may have to be reassembled or reordered when they get there, because they may have taken different paths and got there at different times. So now we've talked about everything. So let's let's try to go through the big picture and remember our original scenario where a client wanted to get a web page from Netflix. So the idea is that to get the web page, the client's going to construct a packet, and that packet's going to have the message we want the destination IP address, the port on the server where the, uh, the server is listening for this type of message, the source, right, our own IP address, as well as the port where we are listening on for a response. And now we transmit it over to the server. When the server gets it, the server looks at the port and then it decides what application it needs to go to. So it decides that it's for the web server, so it sends that packet over to the web server application that consumes it, it processes the message, and it figures out what the appropriate response is. Right? And then it generates a response packet that has the response in it. And now we've basically just flipped it. So now the old source IP and port now becomes the destination, and then the destination IP address becomes the source. And now that message goes back to the client. And when the client gets it, the client uh, looks at the port, determines that the web browser was the one that was requesting that information, gives it to the web browser, and the web browser uses it to generate the web page itself. Right? So why does any of this matter? Um, I kind of alluded to it in the beginning of the video, but networks are an integral part of the way that the armed forces fights 24th century warfare. Um, without a network, there's really no way to share targeting data, communicate with each other, uh, just basically have any type of situational awareness on, on the battlefield. This is our greatest strength, is our ability to form these networks in uh, very sparse or regions without a lot of infrastructure, and our adversaries know it. And that's why they are always out there finding ways to try to disrupt our networks. If they can stop us from communicating with each other, um, basically all of our cool weapons stop working. So it's incumbent on us to know how it works, to know how we can defend it. And that kind of brings us to the end of today's lecture. Uh, like I said, I've, I've talked to you at a high level. We went into some detail about how clients and servers work. You know a lot more now about how IP addresses and ports work. And we talked a little bit about circuit versus packet switch networks. Thanks for watching, uh, and we'll see you next lesson. All right, bye.